You know, the nice thing, there are two nice things about being in the ministry a long time and getting older. Um, you redo a lot of what you did before, but you don't remember it. <laughs> and so you learn new things all the time. And so I had a, a blast uh, restudying the New Covenant. And my guess is, if I had a video of 25 years ago, a sermon of me preaching on the New Covenant, it would be the same. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to look into your word, and we pray, Lord, that you would teach us. And uh, this is the very covenant where you promised that uh, you would be able to teach us by what you've done in our lives. And so I pray, Father, that you would help us and help us to understand your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm reading from Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. So if you turn, I'm reading from the New American Standard. Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. And hold on, I spilled my water and I have to wipe it. There we go. Okay, there we go. All right. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. And so this is a, a great prophecy. Of course, it's picked up uh, in Hebrews, uh, the book of Hebrews, and its, its fulfillment, which we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit. And this is... Uh, uh, this prophecy spoke a lot to me when I was a, a young believer uh, because growing up in a sort of a modern Orthodox Jewish irreligious home, that does actually sound inconsistent, but it exists. It, it's, you don't eat kosher, in the, eat kosher in the house, and when you go out to have Chinese food, you can eat spare ribs, basically. And so I was raised uh, in a pretty traditional Jewish home, and, you know, to, to even hear about a new covenant uh, was something amazing to me. And uh, so my task this morning, and our task together, I, I believe, is to try and understand uh, this new covenant. And so we're just going to delve in, look at the passage, and see what it means. So there are a couple of really important key terms uh, in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. And uh, we will look at verses 35 through 37 later, which I believe is part of the covenant as well. Uh, the first word that uh, I think we should look at is the word hadash, the word new, the word new. And the Hebrew word hadash, is, uh, it's a very common word in the Old Testament, and it means either new or sometimes can be renewed. And in this instance, if it simply means new, then it refers to something that may have existed prophetically but hasn't been implemented yet, so it's, it's new. So the new covenant is brand new. And uh, it comes, it was revealed in the old covenant, but it's, it's new. It doesn't implement itself until the coming of Yeshua, Jesus the Messiah. If it means renewed, then uh, people who usually say that believe it refers to the Mosaic covenant, which gets renewed. So you have the Mosaic Covenant, you still need to keep it, but now you have the power to keep it. You follow me? And so the people who usually believe that, there are Messianic Jews, Jewish believers, some dear friends of mine, uh, who believe that this, it should be a renewed covenant, not just a new covenant, uh, and that the elements of the new covenant now enable us to keep the Torah the law, which we were unable to keep previously. And so it's a renewed covenant. So it's not that the new has replaced the old. It's just that 
the old is now possible, made possible to keep because it's, there's been a renewal. And the renewal was not in the law. The renewal was in us. So now we're capable of keeping. Now, this does not mean that uh, these Messianic Jews believe that we are saved by keeping the law. They know that's not true. But they believe that it's still an obligation and that we have more power through the new covenant to be able to keep the law, to keep the Torah. Uh, there are also, uh, I've read a lot of stuff about non-Jews who interpret the new covenant as a renewed covenant. And uh, they are non-Jewish people who believe, again, that they should not keep the law for salvation purposes, but uh, it should be the mark of a godly lifestyle that you keep the Torah, that you keep all the festivals of Israel, you keep the Shabbat, you eat kosher, and uh, you probably know Gentile believers who do that. Maybe you are one of them. And, uh, and so I have actually a third alternative um, to new or renewed, actually. I like, I like fulfilled. And so uh, I believe that the new covenant is new. There is an element of renewal. But the new covenant is not unrelated to previous covenants. So it's new in that it's a new covenant, but there are previous covenants which the new covenant is very much related to. There's the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, and the Davidic covenant. These were particular covenants made uh, uh, by God uh, between himself and the Jewish people. And the new covenant is, so to speak, is a fourth covenant. Now, others might say that there is a quote-unquote Palestinian covenant, which I think is sort of related to the Mosaic Covenant. I mean, you can start parsing these covenants pretty well. An Edenic Covenant. If you're really, really Reformed, you can say there's a covenant of grace. I mean, you can go crazy on covenants. Uh, but we want to keep it simple, right? And, uh, but I think that there are four major covenants that God made with the Jewish people, the Abrahamic, Mosaic, Davidic, and the New Covenant. And there are, the Hebrew word covenant is the Hebrew word brit, and it's a word that's not complicated. It just simply refers to an agreement, a covenant made between men and nations, between men and God. Uh, in uh, Judaism, the word uh, brit is used synonymously with circumcision. And uh, most covenants in the Bible are uh, sealed in blood. And uh, so Brit is usually associated with the shedding of blood, which was the sealing, the way a covenant was sealed. There are other ways to seal covenants, but that was a main one. And then there are two major types of covenants, even of these four covenants. Uh, there is a conditional covenant and an unconditional covenant. A conditional covenant means you do your part and then I'll do mine. An unconditional covenant means you do your part because I'm going to enable you to do your part and I will do mine and actually the whole thing depends upon me. That's an unconditional covenant. Um, salvation, all you ever did to get into the new covenant was say yes to Yeshua. He did everything for you. Somehow, he even helped you get to faith, depending on your theological perspective. But every theological perspective implies that Yeshua, by the Holy Spirit, helped you come to faith. So he did the work. He helped you accept it. All glory to him. That is why I believe that it's an unconditional covenant. And then we have a conditional covenant like the Mosaic Law. And so we're going to go through each of the covenants and just look at them. Uh, and I believe that the new covenant is very much an unfolding of the Abrahamic covenant, the covenant that God made with Abraham. And so uh, we're going to look at that uh, in just a moment. Now, before we do, I just want us to look just a little carefully at verse uh, 31 of chapter th 31, just to make sure you understand this. Days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. But look at verse 32. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them out 
by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them. So whether you're on the new side or renewal side, you know it's not the same. Something is markedly different between the Mosaic Covenant, which is what this verse is referring to, and the New Covenant. And so I believe that the New Covenant is probably in some ways more related to the Abrahamic Covenant than it is to the Mosaic Covenant. But just to show you, they are distinctive covenants. They're distinct. Uh, so let's go back to the Abrahamic Covenant just for a moment. And you find that in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country, from your relatives, and from your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. And I'll bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed." Most people who come to a Chosen People conference know that passage by heart, okay? And so I know that you're familiar with that. So, quiz, is that a conditional covenant or an unconditional covenant? Unconditional covenant, okay. So you've been well trained. So uh, it's an unconditional covenant because God takes the responsibility for the implementation of the covenant. It rests upon God. If you remember in Genesis uh, chapter 15, uh, Abram had a, uh, a, a vision, and uh, in that vision, uh, the animals were split in two, laid uh, along the side from one another, and then a uh, pot and a uh, torch, uh, implying the presence of God, passed through uh, the animals, uh, implying, number one, that the covenant was sealed with blood because of the cut uh, animals, and number two, Abram was asleep. He wasn't there. And so who took responsibility for the empowering and enacting of the covenant? God himself. And so that is why I would say that the Abrahamic covenant is an unconditional covenant. There's other language in Scripture which implies that uh, Abram may have had to exercise faith to enjoy the benefits of the covenant. And, and I have no problem with that. I just believe that it's God who brings the faith. So God takes responsibility for the Abrahamic covenant, but God did not take responsibility for the Mosaic covenant in that if you did not obey, you were judged. And if you did obey, then you were blessed. There's no such language in the Abrahamic covenant. God simply says, I'm going to do it. I mean, if there was any covenant, I wish I could have uh, been there when the person found out about it, it was the Abrahamic covenant. I mean... You know the old story about Abram, that uh, his father Terah was an idolatrous priest, and he actually owned a, uh, he was a small businessman. Uh, he owned a uh, woodworking shop where they made idols. You know that story? So it's, just, it's a Talmudic story. So um, how many of you know the story? Okay. All right, less than half. I'll tell it. So, so one day Abram's father Terah uh, goes out to do some errands and uh, leaves Abram, who's uh, a youth, in the idol-making shop, and uh, Abram, uh, and this is a story told by the rabbis to prove that Abram was God's right choice. He was the right man for the job. And so Abram took a hammer, and he destroyed all the idols, except for one. And he left the, I he left the hammer in the hands of the one idol. So then Abram uh, Abram's dad, Terah, comes back, and he looks at Abram sternly, and he says, who did this? And Abram points to the idol with the hammer in his hands, and he says, I don't know, ask him. <laughs> Not a true story, but, but it, it's part of why the rabbis tell us that Abram was the right guy. We really don't know why God chose Abram. All we know from Genesis chapter 11, if you scoot that back to Genesis chapter 9, is that Abram was a descendant of Shem, and Shem was the one through whom the promised line of redemption which began in Genesis 3.15, that's how we know that whoever was going to be that person uh, who was chosen would be a Shemite, drop the H, a Semite, and Abram was that chosen uh, Semite. Why did God actually choose him? Who knows? We'll find out. People say because he had faith. He chose him before he had faith. You know, 
So we don't know why God uh, chose Abram. But anyway, I, I wish I could have been there when God told Abram what was going to happen. Uh, that would have been amazing. Wouldn't you have liked to have been there? But where I really would have liked to have been was I would have liked to have been there when Abram told Sarah. That would have been worth being a fly on the wall. So here's my sanctified or sometimes unsanctified imagination. So God tells Abram all these wonderful things. Uh, I'm going to make you a great nation, a land, all these wonderful promises. And a lot of people are going to be called Abram, Abraham. Any Abrahams here? Well, it's not as popular these days. Okay. And so here's, here's what my thinking is. So Abram uh, went back home. And it was the end of the week, I imagine. So it was Shabbat, before Shabbat was necessarily revealed. And so Abram uh, opens the door and, uh, and uh, smells a wonderful meal, uh, chicken soup and falafel, you know, all, all being made. And uh, Abram walks in, and Sarah looks at Abram and uh, says what every wife says when her husband comes home from work. So how was your day? Exactly what we want to talk about when we get back home. Of course, now the shoe's on the other foot often, and so men remember that. And so Abram says, you know, Sarah, funny you should ask. Something amazing happened today. Sarah perks up, says, finally, he's going to talk about his work. Wow. And so they sit down. They light the candles. She brings out the soup, and she says, so what happened? He says, Sarah, I spoke to God today. Sarah said, wow, really, which one? And Abram says, you can't see him. You would never recognize him. Abram, and so Sarah says, you're speaking to gods you can't see? Already she's suspicious. And uh, then Sarah says, she's playing along. She says, so, and they've already had two cups of Manischewitz. So, so Sarah says, says, so what did he say to you? And Abram said, he said, we're moving. <laughs> And Sarah said, where are we going? He said, I don't know. Sarah says, did you get a job change? Abram said, no. We're supposed to leave everything behind, except Lot. <laughs> oh, no, Lot? <laughs> There's always one like Lot. And so, so what we, what, what's going to happen? And Abram, of course, is busting a gut to want to tell her the, the, big, the big news. And he looks at Sarah and he says, Sarah, I've got to tell you something that he said that's unbelievable. Sarah says, so what is it already? She says, we're going to have a baby. <laughs> and Sarah looks at him and says, Abram, did you tell the God who you're not supposed to talk to because you can't see? And you're probably hearing voices, Abram, you know, because I'm a little old. And you're a little old too, but not so old. <laughs> and so how is it possible that I'm going to have a baby? And Abram said, I don't know. I don't know, but he sounded so convincing. <laughs> of course, Sarah said, eat your soup. You're drunk, you know. The point is, Jewish people are not just the chosen people. Jewish people are the uniquely, supernaturally created people. When God wanted to do something for planet Earth, God took a man, took a woman, implanted a baby, and God created the Jewish people. It's not as if God went around, and there are Jewish stories about this, but we don't have time, where God went around to the different nations offering the Ten Commandments, and everybody said no except the Jewish people. They took it. And, and, and that's the impression sometimes we have of Jewish people being the chosen people. Jewish people were not the chosen people. We weren't even the choosing people. The Jewish people were created from scratch by God in a supernatural act. When God wanted to do something and actually to build a bridge of redemption to a broken wall uh, world, he picked a people and created a nation. That's what he did. He picked a, he picked a couple. And so this is what I mean that the Jewish people... Uh, are a supernatural people. Uh, 
You know, it's interesting, Mark Twain recognized that he wrote in Harper's Bazaar uh, in 1898, I think. He said, if statistics are right, the Jews constitute but 1% of the human race. It suggests a nebulous, dim puff of stardust lost in the blaze of the Milky Way. Properly, the Jews ought hardly to be heard of. But he is heard of, has always been heard of. He is as prominent on the planet as any other people, and his commercial importance is extravagantly out of proportion to the smallness of his bulk. All things are mortal but the Jew. All other forces pass, but he remains, and I love this, what is the secret of his immortality? <laughs> the secret of his immortality is the unconditional covenant that God made with Abram. That's the secret of Jewish immortality. That's why we continue, because God created a people for his purposes and cannot allow that people to be destroyed. So the first unconditional promise in the Abrahamic covenant is that God would create a people that would persevere. Of course, if, he, if this was happening now, he would also say, and also would have one of their finest uh, individuals win the Nobel Prize for Literature. Let's hear it for Bob Dylan. So just, okay, thank you. Uh, the, the second promise in the Abrahamic covenant, which you know is the land that God gave the Jewish people a land. Um, it's unique. Uh, I, you know, there are a lot of people, uh, people groups who are unique and who, are, who have a land but are not living there. But there's almost been nobody who was created before they had their national boundaries. How many nations do you know that were created before they had land? None. So we're talking about a very unique situation and a unique covenant. So Israel had no existence prior to the Abrahamic covenant and would have had no existence outside of the direct intervention of the one who created the heavens and the earth. And the promise of the land and the covenant passes through the physical descendants. Genesis 17, 7, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your seed after you throughout the generations for an everlasting covenant in order to be your God and your seeds, God after you. God committed himself unconditionally to preserve the nation of the Jewish people and to give the Jewish people a land. For heaven's sake, the land was not our idea. If it was, what person in their right mind would pick the only piece of land in the Middle East without oil reserves? Some out in the ocean now, mostly natural gas. The third promise, which is sort of implied in the Abrahamic covenant, is the, idea, is the fact that Israel would be in a right relationship with its king, with God. The idea that Israel can only be all God wants her to be when the Jewish people are, are in a right relationship with God is implied in the Abrahamic covenant. Without the relationship with God, the Jewish people would never be what God always wanted them to be. It's almost presumed in the Abrahamic covenant that God would have a relationship with his people. It's, it's essential. The fourth promise was the promise of a mission, of a purpose. God called the Jewish people, he created the Jewish people for a purpose. He gave us a mission, and that mission was to be a blessing to the world. Enough, in other words, the Jewish people were created for the sake of the Gentiles. How do you like that one? Yeah, try... Uh, talking about that in my neighborhood in Brooklyn. And so it's, it's, it's very important to understand those elements are parts of the unconditional Abrahamic covenant, and we're going to see in just a second on how important that is to understanding the new covenant. The Mosaic covenant, I don't want to say a lot about that. It, it, it's, you understand it. It's a conditional covenant. I hope you don't equate the Torah or the uh, with the uh, Mosaic Covenant, though. Uh, the Torah and the Mosaic Covenant, the Torah, which usually means the five books of Moses, Moses, is not just laws, right? 
you know, the rabbis say there are 613 laws in the, uh, in, as part of the law, as part of the Torah. Uh, I, I, I've never counted, but uh, some of them are traditional, some of them are, are biblical, some are uh, laws of omission, some are laws of commission, and so on. But if you read the five books of Moses, you'll find a lot of stories, a lot of narrative, a lot of promises, a lot of prophecy. You find a lot of uh, interesting relationships, you know. You find uh, uh, creation, you know, you find a lot in the five books of Moses. But the law or the Torah, the Mosaic Covenant, was that which was given at Mount Sinai. It began in Exodus 19 and continued forward. It is the legal corpus by which God governs the Jewish people. Got that? That's the Mosaic Covenant. And a lot of you know from your studies about ancient Semitic treaties, suzerain treaties between a vassal and a slave. Do you know about all this? And, and some people use that motif to understand the Mosaic Covenant. I think it's pretty valid. And so you had a uh, vassal, uh, which is Israel. You had a, uh, a lord, which is God. And you had the rules of the kingdom, which is the uh, Mosaic Covenant. And it always implied blessings and curses, blessings for obedience, curses for uh, uh, disobedience. And that, it, there's probably a lot of truth to that. That is a form, in, an ancient Semitic form for the Mosaic Covenant. But it was definitely conditional. You perform or you get punished. Simple. The Davidic covenant is in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 8 through 17. We won't read that, but that is clearly an unconditional covenant. There's no conditions to that. David repents of his sin uh, with Bathsheba, and uh, uh, Nathan says, hey, look, I've got some good news for you. Here it is. God is going to build a house for you palace. But you are not going to build a house for him. <laughs> Your son will. But God's going to build the kind of house for you that you never expected. He's going to build you a dynasty. And at the end of that dynasty will come a king who will actually sit on your throne forever. Now, he doesn't say, David, don't sin or you're going to blow it because he knew who he was dealing with. David had a propensity like us, you know. Can you imagine telling David, don't sin anymore? That would have been a losing battle, just like with us. There's no discussion about what David needs to earn the blessings of this covenant of kings and sovereignty. It was an unconditional covenant. Now we get to the new covenant which I view as an unconditional covenant. And there are four major provisions to the covenant according to Jeremiah, and they're very simple but very profound. So let's look at them, beginning at verse 33. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. Here it is. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Let me just focus on this one provision. God promised the Jewish people that one day the law which was on tablets would be internalized within their very soul. So that when they wanted to do the will of God, they would do it almost naturally, without looking outside of themselves. God would implant his law on their hearts, on their souls. I remember when I was first saved, and I didn't really have time to read the whole Bible yet. And, uh, you know, I, I, every one of us have a different experience. And uh, so I woke up in the morning, and uh, I didn't know what, would, what was next. Uh, number one, I expected to wake up as non-Jewish. Funny thing, woke up, felt as Jewish as I did when I went to sleep. But then something really strange happened. Um, you, you know, a, a typical testimony. I mean, Mike Brown could give his testimony. I can give my testimony. I mean, uh, testimonies like me, mine are a dime a dozen. You know, I'm Jewish. I wasn't that religious. 
I rebelled. I, I did drugs. I sold drugs. I got saved, and I don't do them anymore. It's not a bad testimony. Well, I, I'm hoping it works out. It's been about 45, 46 years for me, too. And so I woke up in the morning, and lo and behold, Romans chapter 7, which I hadn't really read yet, became true in my life and my experience. That which I hated, I didn't want to, that which I hated, I now loved. That which, it was amazing. Now, I still had the other problem in Romans 7, and that was I couldn't always do what I wanted to do. But I wanted to do it, which was definitely a change. <laughs> definitely a change. For me, the law was not written on stones, but it was, you know, in, the, in that really beautiful uh, ark in the front of my shul, in the front of my synagogue. <laughs> but now it had come from behind the curtain in the, in the ark in the synagogue, and it had been implanted on my soul. And even though I couldn't always do it, I knew I wanted to do it. I wanted to live for God, and I still do, and so do you. There are other elements because sin still dwells in us that keeps us from doing the will of God. But I had changed dramatically. I now wanted to do the will of God. And so do you. On the day of Pentecost, God sent his the substitution for his son, who is divine, the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, and the Ruach HaKodesh filled these Jewish believers waiting for the promise of the Father, just like his presence and his person fills you. And I believe that this is a little bit of a metaphor and that he didn't actually write the law on our hearts, I mean, these days we can actually, you know, get a, uh, you know, probably get an x-ray or a CAT scan and see if it's there. You can't see with human eyes what God did to your soul. God put his spirit in your life, driving you, causing you to do what you didn't want to do before, what you couldn't even understand before, the will of God. It's not, in fact, it hasn't removed the need for a Bible because now, because of the Spirit of God in our lives, we can finally understand what's in this book. Our eyes have been opened by the presence of the Holy Spirit within our souls. And it has radically transformed my life. And I know it's transformed yours. Secondly, verse 34, For I will forgive their iniquity and their sins, I will remember no more. This was instituted at the Last Supper. It was sealed at the cross, and it applies to both Jews and Gentiles who believe in Yeshua and also has a future national fulfillment in store for the nation of Israel when the nation turns to the one whom they have pierced. And according to Zechariah, uh, fountains are opened up for the forgiveness of sin. I believe those fountains. I believe like the hymnist, hymn, the hymn writer, that uh, there's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. I think that, that was a great interpretation of, the, of Zechariah uh, 13, 1. And so you and I have experienced forgiveness of sin. As far as the east is from the west, once and for all, for all sin, for all time, you and I have been forgiven. Jews and Gentiles, this applies to all of us. We have been forgiven of our sins. So, you know, I don't know about you, but this is pretty good. And so, God has written his law of, uh, on our souls, which transforms us. And if you don't believe me, ask Gordon Tyner back there. He knew me, okay? And if you want to know about him, I can tell you also. So the Lord has put himself into our lives and we are transformed and he has made us, well, as pure as we can possibly be right now to be the home of the Holy Spirit. He has forgiven our sins and that makes all the difference in the world. We've just gone through Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur on our way to Sukkot and all we were talking about, very sober time, was 
uh, was repentance and atonement and our sin. And oh my gosh, I don't know what I would do without Yeshua, without knowing, because it was, it was one thing for me when I didn't know my sin. It was one thing when I had no concept of the glory of God and I just compared myself to all the poor schleps who were my friends. And I knew that I was much better morally and ethically than them, except Gordon. I mean, I never ripped anybody off selling drugs. I was an honest degenerate. <laughs> but you see, once you understand who God is, once you catch a glimpse of his glory, then you figure out how sinful you are. And part of the journey and pilgrimage of our life in the Lord is discovering how holy he is, how sinful we still are, and how grateful we are for his forgiveness. Verse 33 again, Israel will be in a right relationship with God. But this is the covenant I make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it. And here it is. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, this is obviously a national promise to the Jewish people. Gentiles get in on it a little bit, you know. But this is primarily a promise to the Jewish people that the Gentiles are grafted in just like the rich root of the olive tree, right? And so we experience some of this in part, just like Mike said last night, but we're looking forward to the day when we'll get the whole enchilada, right? So the day is coming when the Jewish people will finally enjoy the fulfillment of the Abrahamic destiny that God marked on the Jewish people from the very beginning by the promise to Abraham, they will be God's people. The Jewish people will be the people God wants them to be. That day is future. Verse 34 also. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. That is a, an important part of the new covenant, but I don't know how to tell you this. This hasn't become true yet. So some aspects of the new covenant are true, are, are relevant today. It's happened. It's been fulfilled. But this is clearly something that hasn't happened yet because if it had happened, I'd be out of a job. So clearly, a day is coming in the future when we will all be out of work and the Great Commission will have been fulfilled. There will no longer be a need for internet strategy, street evangelism, or missions. There won't be any need for us to preach the gospel because everybody will know the Lord. Can you imagine what a day that's going to be? I mean, think about it. That's our hope. The day is coming when all those around us will know the Lord, and we will spend all eternity enjoying his presence. That's a universal promise that applies to all humanity. And so, brothers and sisters, some parts of the new covenant have come to pass, and some parts of the new covenant are future. Can you see that? Now let me throw in verse 35 and following. Thus says the Lord, and my good friend Arnold Fruchtenbaum, a lot of you know Arnold and have enjoyed his teaching, but Arnold entitles this message, How to Destroy the Jews. Have you ever heard him do that? Okay, so here's how, if you want to destroy the Jewish people, here's what you do. Thus says the Lord who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord. Got that? So if you can point a missile at the sun, moon, and stars and destroy the, the order of the planets, if you can do that, then the offspring of Israel will also cease from being a nation before me forever. I said that the new covenant is related to the Abrahamic covenant. They are both unconditional. 
And God said that he would preserve the Jewish people until the purpose for which he chose the Jewish people is complete. And that has not happened yet. Therefore, this promise is true. God is preserving his people. Thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured, the foundations of the earth searched out below, then I will cast off all the offspring of Israel for all they have done, declares the Lord. Replacement theology is what? Biblical? Come on. This great interpreter of Scripture, David L. Cooper, who some of us were raised on and used to uh, and actually trained Burl Haney, who ran the printing press for chosen people here in Zarephath. He used to say, when the plain sense of Scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense. And then he would add, unless you have a reason for it. There's no reason to say that God didn't mean what he said. It might seem impossible, but he's God. He said that the Jewish people will fulfill their national purpose. Now, just one last statement in closing. The new covenant does not imply that the church has replaced the Jewish people in the plan of God. In Hebrews chapter 8, the author who remets, remains anonymous, first question I ask when I get to heaven, okay, who wrote it? Okay, so Hebrews 8, 6 through 7, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion for a second. And then in verse 13, then he quotes the, the uh, Jeremiah 31, uh, he or she quotes Jeremiah 31, when he said, a new covenant he has made the first obsolete, but whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. Here's the problem. People have used that passage to say, therefore, that shows the Jewish people are obsolete. That's not what the text says. It says that the covenant has run its course. It's been made obsolete in that it has been fulfilled. It's, 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 it's still the word of God will always have value. But the covenantal relationship that God desires between himself and and his chosen people has been changed. It's new. It's a new covenant. It doesn't mean that the Jewish people no longer exist. The basis for ongoing Jewish identity, the ongoing basis for the Jewish nation, is not the Mosaic covenant. It's the Abrahamic covenant, which is un no conditions. And that's picked up in the, new in the New Covenant and in the Davidic Covenant. No, that is not a good interpretation that the New Covenant or Jesus, the cross, the work of the Messiah, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and his soon appearing, this and the creation of the church, members, Jews, and Gentiles, this has in no way made the Jewish people and the purposes God has for Israel and the Jewish people obsolete. Absolutely not. I have met Jewish people today who believe in Yeshua. I understand there are some Gentiles who believe Jesus is the Messiah. I've heard. Maybe true, maybe not. But the fact that we have been brought into the richness of this new covenant and that Gentiles have been co-heirs with Jewish people in the promises of God. You've been grafted into the rich, actually the Greek word is fat, the rich root or the fat root of the olive tree, which is the covenants and promises of God which nourish our souls. It does not mean that we have pre-placed the original. In fact, Daryl Bach, one of uh, our board members and a co-writer, uh, editor on some of our, our books, he, he always says, the inclusion of the Gentiles does not demand the exclusion of the Jews. We are in this together, looking towards a brighter future, to the ultimate fulfillment. That includes the land. It includes so many wonderful things for the Jewish people. That will happen in the Messiah. But I'll tell you, I totally agree with Mike. It's incremental. We're on our way. 
Are the Jewish, did the land promises, are they fulfilled? Not totally yet. Are they being fulfilled? I believe Ezekiel 36 and 37, the Jewish people are coming back to the land in unbelief. But it's not the total, it's not the whole thing yet. It's going to happen. Does everybody know the Lord? Not by a long shot, but a lot of people do. A lot more people after Jesus came than before. So in part, this is happening in part. But we're headed towards what Joel Rosenberg says, a Romans 11:25 future, 26. We're on our way, but we're on our way as forgiven sinners with God's Spirit in our lives so that we can do the will of God, so that we can serve His purposes together today. The church doesn't replace Israel. One day, God will fulfill His purposes for Israel in Yeshua, and then, you know what, in that day, we'll all be united so beautifully. It's a great day. We have a bright future. Thank God for his new covenant. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love and mercy, for your word, and I pray, Lord, that you would use these truths to transform our lives, to appreciate what we have, and Lord, help us to be mindful of what's ahead, and help us to uh, understand this so that we can be used uh, in this great work of bringing the new covenant message to a broken world. In Yeshua's name, amen.